Okay. Good morning, everybody. I believe that my technical challenges have been uh, have been corrected here on my end. So I want to welcome everybody to our webinar on using OER to reduce student costs and increase student learning. My name is James Glaufen Grossklag. I'm with College of the Canyons and the Community College Consortium for Open Educational Resources. And welcome to this Friday of Open Education Open Education Week. I sure hope that Everyone has had an opportunity to participate in some activity throughout Open Ed Education Week. Uh, if you take a minute or two to introduce yourself in the chat window down in the bottom left of the screen, that would be terrific. We would love to learn about you, uh, where you are from, and uh, whether or not you are involved in Open Education already. I see some, uh, some very experienced folks out there. Um, uh, who are very experienced in, in open education, and we, I really appreciate seeing them here today. Um, also, please let us know if you have had the opportunity to participate in any, any other activities during this Open Education Week. We've had a lot of great, great things going on all over the world. And one of the things I love about the whole concept of Open Education Week is that it's a terrific reminder that open education is a global activity. It's a global initiative uh, through uh, so many different organizations and individuals. Uh, if you just take a look at the Open Education Week website, it will be uh, it's really stunning to see how many activities there are all over the place. At any rate, it's my pleasure to be with you today uh, on the uh, sort of the driving side of of the technology. I have my colleague John Makovich, Director of Distance and Accelerated Learning here at College of the Canyons. I uh, appreciate his help in getting everything set up today. And I see also joining us today is Una Daly, the Community College Outreach Manager for the Open Courseware Consortium. I appreciate her joining us. I know she's had a very, very busy week. I see uh, Lots of folks from the Open Doors group as well, and I know they've had a very, very busy week uh, spreading the word. So we appreciate everybody taking the time to join us today. Uh, we uh, want to share some information about what we're doing here at College of the Canyons and hopefully uh, inspire some of you who are not involved in OER to uh, become involved in OER and to see what a great difference you can make uh, for your students and uh, how I'm not going to say how easy it is, but how doable, how, how achievable it is to get involved. So we'll move on forward here. Uh, there you see uh, my affiliation here at College of the Canyons. Um, I am, have been neglectful in uh, including our Community College Consortium for Open Educational Resources logo there, but uh, I certainly do give a shout out to CCC OER and all the great work that the community colleges in the United States and Canada are doing. So without further ado, let's uh, just dive in and uh, give you guys, give everybody a, a sense of, of what we're doing here at College of the Canyons and where we are. Uh, we are in beautiful, sunny Southern California. Um, I know that some, Jessica was sharing earlier that she's in, in Maryland. Uh, and I don't know where everybody else is, but uh, um, I certainly can tell you that uh, here we are in beautiful sunny Southern California. It's probably going to get up to 80 degrees today, so we like where we are. Um, and many of you know that California has long been a leader in open educational resources beginning back in the early 2000s with the activities of Dr. Martha Cantor and Mr. Hal Popkin uh, of the Foothill of the Anza Community College District, uh, as well as um, the efforts of Dr. Judy Baker and uh, Jackie Hood, uh, who were also associated with Foothill to Anza. So we really appreciate all the uh, examples we've had here in California. Uh, a little bit about uh, us here in Santa Clarita, or here in the College of the Canyons. We are located in Santa Clarita, California. We're a little bit north of Los Angeles. Uh, the city of Santa Clarita is a relatively new city. Um, we have a pretty good sized population. Uh, approaching 300,000, and we are the fourth largest city in the Los Angeles area. And uh, oops, let me, a little bit about College of the Canyons. We are one of 112 California community colleges. We, if um, if we uh, uh, think about the entire system, California community colleges serve nearly 3 million students a year. We're the largest single system of higher education in the world. Uh, 
at College of the Canyons, we offer two-year degrees, certificates, we prepare students to transfer to university, and we focus very heavily on career training as well. We currently serve 24,000 students, and we've been fortunate to have been involved in promoting open education since 2006. Moving on to uh, OER, I look, judging from the audience, uh, audience here, I think we probably don't need the OER definition. Um, and I'll give you a few seconds to, to take a look at that if you're not familiar. Now at College of the Canyons, uh, we articulate the benefits of OER in the following ways here. Uh, and I know there are many different ways to articulate the benefits of OER, and, and I certainly we don't mean to suggest that these are the only benefits of open educational practice. There are many, many benefits that go beyond what, what, what we talk about here, but this, these are the benefits that, that work for our context in a community college. Number one, we want to reduce costs for students. Uh, in a California community college, a typical class will cost a student $138 uh, to take. Now a commercially produced textbook could cost the same amount. It could cost $138. It could even cost more. It could cost, it could cost up to $200 um, or even more. Uh, so it's, off, it's sometimes the case that the cost of the book will be more than the cost of the class. So we want to do everything possible to reduce those costs for our students. And by reducing costs, we believe that we increase access to higher education. The core mission of a community college in the United States is to increase access, to provide an opportunity for everyone in our society to gain access to higher education. In addition, this is extremely important for us at College of the Canyons, we want to support faculty innovation. If our faculty colleagues have ideas about using technology, ideas about creating content, about sharing content, about redesigning their courses. We want to do everything possible to, um, to uh, uh, support them. And we believe that uh, being involved in OER, uh, utilizing technology in new ways uh, helps to uh, support faculty innovation. Now at College of the Canyons, what we found over the past uh, couple of years now, we're going our second year of, of, of achieving the number the number that you see here on the screen, uh, we've been able to save students $250,000 over two semesters over our fall and spring semesters are now we have, but our faculty colleagues, some of whom will be joining us this morning, have been able to save our students this much money in textbook savings, in textbook costs by adopting uh, open textbooks and producing open textbooks uh, as well. So that's, that's a real number. That, that's a real tangible um, advantage for our students, a real tangible way that our students have gained greater access to education by having reduced costs. Uh, for, and uh, uh, also a uh, quick little history, very brief history of what we've focused on here at College of the Canyons. Uh, we've tried very hard to create a culture of sharing uh, so that our colleagues uh, believe that um, or are, are, are supported in their efforts to, uh, to share. Um, we want to make sharing uh, a, core, a core value here at our institution. Uh, there, there, we've gone through times when we've been worked very hard to create content and discover content. And, and there's so much great content out there now um, in, in the open educational world that uh, uh, it's no longer the case that uh, engaging in OER or engaging in open education means that you have to create content. Although again, we've got colleagues on the phone uh, on the webinars with us today who have done just that. So uh, without further ado, I want to turn it over to uh, one of our most uh, creative colleagues here at College of the Canyons, Professor Regina Blasberg, uh, who is Department Chair of Engineering Technologies. And she can tell you what all that entails, engineering technologies. And She's agreed. She's been kind enough to share a few minutes with us this morning to talk about uh, two open textbooks that she and a colleague in her department have uh, have created and are utilizing in their courses now. Regina. Hi, James. I'm not sure if everyone can hear me. I hope so. Yep. Um, loud and clear. Oh, good. Okay. Um, Regina Blasberg from the Department of Engineering Technologies. There are four programs 
within my department, which would include water systems technology, construction management technology, land surveying, and manufacturing technology. And I've been working closely with our water part-time faculty. I am the only full-time faculty in all of those areas. Um, and we were able, with the help from an adopter community grant and also just on our own, in creating two different textbooks for our water program. The students in our water program, we are focused on generating operators. And in the state of California, they need to complete state licensure for operators. So our math courses are directed towards helping them learn and understand the types of questions and the math that will be requested of them when they take their treatment or distribution licensing tests through the state of California. And we've been very successful using these materials. It was also a situation where there wasn't really a great textbook out there already. We were using a document that someone else had created many years ago initially, probably six or seven years ago, and realized that that was not functioning well for us. The American Water Works Association publishes a lot of materials, but again, there wasn't anything that was really well suited for the classroom that fit well with our program and was providing the need for our students in terms of meeting their licensing need as well as completing our program. So Mike Alvord was extremely instrumental in writing these texts, and I've been working with him in editing these texts. Um, Mike Alvord is from our local industry. He is an adjunct, but he is also a full-time member of our industry and is on our advisory board. His boss is on our advisory board. And our local industry partners are also very supportive of these efforts in providing opportunities for Mike to work with us on these projects. So it's been really successful, and students are really, uh, they really seem to like it. We've been able to make arrangements with our bookstore here on campus in the past to work with our repro graphics office here on campus so that students can pay to have their book printed if they wish it in that format, and they can then purchase it through the bookstore. James, do you remember what that cost was? I want to say it was like 10 or $15 or something. I think it was $10. Yeah, I mean, for a very inexpensive amount of money, they can have it simply bound and purchased through the bookstore if they still would like a paper copy, which has worked out really well. Um, so we're hoping to survey the students in the fall to find out again from them, are they, you know, is this working for them? But all of the comments so far have been fairly positive. Uh, and of course, they're loving the fact that they're not having to purchase a $150 textbook from AWWA. So, wow, $150 for the other textbook. They can. Well, because, because the bookstore marks up the book, right? right? I mean, you know, students don't purchase the direct price. Even though we do get a discount as a member of AWWA, then the bookstore still adds on its markup. So it still becomes incredibly expensive for students in purchasing books from So that. the textbook would cost students more than the actual class would cost them. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Regina, a question in the chat. Uh, what incentives led faculty to develop OER content for courses? Mm. Did we? Did we? I, I would say that in this particular program, because I think it's different in my other programs, we're also working on, I just rolled out this semester in our land surveying program. I don't even know if James knows this, but we uh, generate a, la a lab manual that we're now offering as OER for the uh, Surveying 101 class. Um, it really came out of a need for the material. You know, um, Mike teaches these courses primarily, and there just wasn't something out there that worked well and was afford. I mean, there really wasn't something out there that worked well. Period. But on top of that, there wasn't something out there that was affordable and that could be easily adapted into the classroom. So it kind of came out of that need. As, and, he, and Mike has been teaching for us for more years than I've been with the college. I, I'm, he's easily been here over 10 years. And it was like, you know, if I'm going to keep teaching this class, I really need to develop materials that work well for our curriculum, for our students, to help them get their licensure. And there just wasn't something there to fill the gap that we had access to and that was affordable. Well, Regina, I'll, if I can maybe read, read the minds of some of the folks in the audience. It sounds almost too good to be true. Are you saying that you, that you and your colleague developed open content just because it was going to help your students? I would say that was the driving force in the initial, in the initial textbook, uh, the Water 030 class, the beginning math class. 
And then um, it worked so well, and the response was so positive. And then we were able to get some funding from the Adopter Community Grant that it made it that much easier to do the second book, which was the Advanced Water Waterworks Map, the O31. Great. So, well, I, I mean, really, that was our push initially from the department. Wonderful, wonderful, and and. Again, you know, I don't want to suggest that in every case it's going to work. That we that you're going to have colleagues like Regina and and Mike who are going to do it for, you know, for for really the the, the, the absolute most amazingly right reason there is. And that is because the student it's, it's the best thing for the students. Not everybody has time, and I know Regina is the, the last person on campus who has extra time, but uh, uh, we certainly appreciate uh, her efforts in in uh, in working together with Mike to uh, create the book because it is the right thing. Uh, for students and uh, Jackie Hood from the Open Doors Group and, the, and College Open Textbooks uh, noted in the chat that uh, she just looked at the book and it could easily be repurposed for developmental math, especially the first part of the text. So there's an interesting, interesting twist on it. Uh, and then I'll add to it, James, too, that you know as well that we've been pushing really hard to move our water program, and we've done so to a 100% online program. So this effort was also in support of that. We felt that you know if we're going to be able to offer these courses as 100% online courses, then we need to keep moving towards having online resources as well. I mean, it ties into that um, goal that our department had as well. Excellent. Yes, which also of course ties into to the core mission of the college, and that is to expand access and make make education more more easily accessible to students. And particularly in your area and in career technical areas, uh, many of your students are working full time during the day, and either evening classes or online classes present the best option for them to to go to school. Yes, and we're only one of maybe seven water programs throughout the state of California. So, and yet, you know, this is a need everywhere. Water yeah. operators are a need everywhere. So we recognize as well that with the state budget crisis, we're not going to be able to continue to replicate programs across 112 community colleges. And therefore, we need to also be able to provide that service since we are so few and far between. Fabulous. But Regina, remind us real quickly, uh, what kind of a license do you have on the book? And can other people use it? Um, John, if you're on here, please answer that question. But I'm pretty sure we just have our standard uh, Creative Commons license. That's right. So we have a we have a CC BY license, is what we use here at the College of the Co College of the Canyon. So uh, absolutely, positively, it's available for everyone else to use. There's a uh, a link to the uh, to the text there in the in the uh, in the slideshow. And uh, um, please use it, uh, adapt it, uh, give feedback to us. Yes, um, I was going to say, send me questions, send me comments. <laughs> yes, we would love that. John, if you could put uh, Regina's email in the uh, chat window, that would be terrific. And uh, um, I, my contact information is going to be up at the at the end of the slideshow. So, and terrific. then James, I apologize, but I need to uh, head yep. on to another commitment. So I know that. Thank you so much for taking the time. We really appreciate it. Great work, guys. Thank Thanks, you so James. much. Mm -hmm. Bye. All right. Well, mo thank you for that. And uh, moving on, then uh, another example of uh, a, not of creating uh, an open text here at the college, but of adapting and and adopting existing open content. Well, oh, here we go. Here's a, uh, we I forgot to move this forward for Regina, but uh, we have a slide on the pros and cons of building your own content. And let me just walk us through this very briefly. So on the on the positive side, of course, we have full flexibility in uh, creating the content. The con, of course, is it takes a long time. It can take a long time to develop. Uh, Regina was fortunate in that she uh, had a, an industry expert who uh, was really one of the driving forces behind doing it. So she was able to work together in a team. Uh, uh, an advantage, of course, is that you can tailor the content to your own particular teaching style. A potential con is that you don't have outside expertise. Um, uh, guiding you and, and, and providing sort of that, that uh, uh, connection to industry. Um, on the advantage side, you can vouch for your own work. If, if you're the faculty member or the content expert, then you want to uh, you you believe that you are the best qualified, of course, to uh, create that content. And um, on the other hand, there is also an increasing amount of peer-reviewed content out there. 
and then Charles from the Open Doors group adds the pro that it's easier to keep content current. Absolutely, positively, it's easier to keep content current. As a as an aside, uh, on that note, my 10-year-old uh, son recently did a did a uh, produced a paper for his school in which uh, he had to write a persu uh, write a persuasive paper for or against a, a certain position. He wrote in favor of e-books over traditional paper books, and one of his main points that he came up with on his own, I swear, uh, I didn't prompt him, was that uh, uh, paper books become out of date very quickly, and it's easier to keep digital content more current. So. Uh, that's certainly in the air out there if a 10-year-old is telling us that. Now moving on then to another, another example of what we're doing here at College of Canyons and our colleagues who are teaching uh, with this content were not able to join us this morning. Uh, we have a uh, group of math faculty that have adopted Carnegie Mellon co content from Carnegie Mellon's Open Learning Initiative. Many of you out there in the open educational uh, resources world know that is, this is extremely high, high, high quality content. And our math faculty uh, were looking for uh, new content, new uh, books or material to use uh, for statistics within uh, intermediate algebra and uh, a, an introduction to statistics class. Um, they looked at a lot of different content, including publisher produced material. They were not an, in any way, shape, or form committed to uh, low cost or no cost material. They were not committed to any kind of open material. They were simply looking for the best possible material for uh, redesigning a statistics path for students. And uh, they decided, uh, after much review of content, they decided that the best, the sim simply the best content for their students, the highest quality content was. Uh, the content with, uh, with Carnegie Mellon's Open Learning Initiative. So that content is free to students and that's uh, really powerful uh, at our college where we serve thousands and thousands of students, um, thousands and thousands of students in, uh, in math classes every year. We have uh, more than I think we have nearly 200 sections of math every year and we have uh, this semester, uh, 25 sections of of a, statistic, of a statistic, no, excuse me, of a statistics pathway course that is utilizing this uh, this content from Carnegie Mellon. So uh, that's 25 sections of classes with 35 students apiece who are not being asked to purchase a $200 textbook. So those numbers get get real pretty quickly, and we're very very pleased. Um, uh, about our math colleagues' uh, ability to use that material, and we applaud Carnegie Mellon. I think, as, uh, as most of us do in the open educational world, we applaud Carnegie Mellon's OLI for continuing to produce very high quality content. Now, I'm going to pause for a second and look for uh, our next presenter. I'm not seeing our next presenter on here. I know John was looking for her. Uh, let's see. Well, in the meantime, we have. Um, Jim from Open Doors Group asks, "Does free access mean no cost to students?" Oh, that's a tricky one, uh, Jim. We know that you know you know that's a hotly debated topic uh, within the open education world. Um, you know, we'll, I, I'm I'm going to be agnostic on on that point uh, as to whether uh, free access should be no cost or low cost. <clears throat> but you know, our our perspective is. Uh, that ten dollars, fifteen dollars, twenty dollars. If it's a um, text that's uh, sold through your college store or licensed um, in a way that permits uh, uh, some markup, uh, that's a heck of a lot better than two hundred dollars that a traditionally published textbook would cost. Uh, we're at College of the Canyons. You know, I'll, wear, I'll keep wearing my College of the Canyons hat for this, for this webinar. At College of the Canyons, uh, we're interested in increasing access to education for our students. Uh, we're not we're not out to make a point about the about you know one 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 perspective or another in the open education world. We want to uh, increase access for students by lowering costs. And again, a twenty dollar textbook is a heck of a lot better than a two hundred dollar textbook. So we're interested in the best content and low cost or no cost are both uh, both great for our students. Um, so thank you, Jim, for understanding that. 
Uh, so again, I'm going to look for Katie, uh, Catherine Coleman. I don't see our so see our, our next presenter on here. Um, I don't. I think John's looking for her. But uh, in the meantime, I will move on to uh, I'll give you an overview of what uh, she will be talking about when she joins us momentarily. I hope um, we have a group of faculty in our sociology department who have adopted uh, adopted sociology texts that uh, have been produ uh, initially produced uh, elsewhere. Uh, shortly, we hope uh, Professor Catherine Coleman from our sociology department will be joining us uh, to talk about an introduction to sociology texts. And I know the college. Uh, the Open Doors group and the College Open Textbooks group have been uh, instrumental in promoting this book. I'm going to pause. Katie, is that you? It is. Hey, Katie, great. I, we, perfect timing. We just got to your material. And uh, I'm going to uh, rewind uh, 30 seconds and say, everybody, we're pleased to have Professor Catherine Coleman from our sociology department uh, join us uh, this morning to talk about uh, their efforts in uh, adopting uh, an introduction intro to sociology textbook. Uh, Catherine, take it away. Okay, great. Um, good morning, everybody. I uh, we actually adopted a couple of textbooks. We did do a uh, an introduction to sociology textbook, and we've also adopted um, a intimate relationships, marriage, and family textbook. Essentially, we were given a bunch of really organized notes from another consulting professor out in Utah, Ron Hammond. And he said, do with it what you want. And uh, Anne Marenko and myself decided we wanted to make this into an open source textbook. And it took us about, there were only two of us on the project in the very beginning. And to turn it into a textbook, we it took us about, I'd say, um, a summer session. And we launched it that next fall. And what we found was um, the, the Chapters we made, we had cut down to about 15 pages from a standard about 45 in a, in a regular intro textbook for sociology. And we didn't change our exams, and our uh, our lectures weren't, they were a little modified, but not by much. But with the exam questions that were not modified, with this new textbook, the exam scores went through the roof with students. And we attributed that to their ability to read through the material more easily. It was about a 15 page chapter as opposed to 45. There were um, we could create the own, our own examples, and we sort of wrote the textbook around our teaching styles. And what's really neat about that is anybody who takes this textbook, this free textbook, can modify it around their teaching styles as well. And um, it's free, of course, to students, and that gets them very excited. And we found that they were more. First of all, they would have the book on the first day of class, which is which is a bonus. But they were also more willing to participate in class discussions and having read the material before coming to class with this with this accessible open education textbook. So those are some of the big our biggest uh, pros with adopting. That's why we decided to move on from the introductory coach textbook and actually add also the work on the marriage and family textbook. And we're currently now in the middle of a women's studies textbook, a gender studies textbook, really. Because we've had such great success with these with these other two in our classes. So, Katie, a couple of couple of questions here. There's a, a, one question in the uh, chat window, and let me let me share that uh, bef before you spoke, uh, we had Regina Blasberg from our water technology department uh, uh -huh. talking about the two uh, water mathematics textbooks that she and, and Mike Alvord produced, uh, and the same question was posed to them. Um, and the question is, did you receive any Incentives uh, to create the book. No. <laughs> In other words, did, did we pay you? <laughs> no. We um, when actually when Anne called me and said, "Hey, well, I'm working on this open source textbook," I said, "Fantastic! Sign me up." And then she told me how many hours it would take, and I kind of said, "Oh, uh, you know, I thought we could use it for that summer session that we were planning, but it took us the entire summer session just to, you know, because we wanted to tweak it to make sure that when we launched it, it was, you know, to our standards and." As, as, as it could be, but no, there was no <laughs> incentive to write it. Other than we knew, we knew how excited our students would be to have a free textbook. Okay, so let's 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 ask that question another way. So why why did you do that? Why did you, did you and your colleagues spend hours upon hours upon hours uh, adopting that adapting that textbook? Because we really felt, and now we know that it would, uh, but we felt it would enhance their educational experience at CSC. We know how expensive textbooks are, and we knew we had the material. 
right in front of us for free. So if it was just a summer session of, of adapting that material into a textbook, we could use it. We've used it now for we're in our third year across six or seven semesters, well really nine semesters if you include the summer, and countless classes. Um, thousands of students have used this textbook now and they're getting the same information that they would have had they paid. Uh, the textbook I was using before, brand new, was $125. And that was on the lower end of the spectrum for, for a cost for an intro book. Right. And, 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 mm -hmm. and $125, that's just about the same cost as the course. Right. So, they, I mean, and you know, 125 I would encourage them to go on any site they could to find an older edition, to, to buy a used book. Um, but even then, the used, the used the median amount was still between fifty and seventy five dollars for a used edition, even at the um, sometimes at the college bookstore. But um, this this book we knew would have the same material, so we put hours and time in knowing. Just and we wanted also to see that reaction on the first day to say, here's your free textbook. So they knew from the beginning that we were, you know, we're on their side for their learning and trying to enhance their learning from the very beginning. Um, and then of course we have a list actually within the two textbooks. Chapters are only about 15 pages, but then in the back there is a list of each chapter. There's a list of resources, video clips, um, surveys, uh, group activities, um, partner activities, take home, you know, mini quizzes. We we sort of created all of these other supplemental materials to go with it, and then other people who use this adopt this textbook can pick and choose what they like. You know, maybe it's none of it, or maybe it's all of it. But um, yeah, that that was our main motivation there. Well, make sure that you're actually reading it and, and getting excited. That, that's phenomenal. I appreciate that. Now, uh, how, how another question is: How long did it take to create, let's say, the the initial adaptation, and how? What's your refresh rate, or what, what's what are your thoughts on on updating? We update every semester. Oh, well, every other semester we update. So, but it ends up being every semester for us because we'll update every other semester for Social 101, the intro book. And then we'll update every other semester for the marriage and family. So they are very current. We have the most, you know, updated and new statistics um, and information, and any you know sort of news breaking stories we would of course add into those. Um, so they are expanding that way. Um, and when you're saying we, it's, so it's a it's a team of people. It's you. It's it's another professor, Amaranko, and I believe another uh, Thea Alvarado as well. Yeah, so when she she came to COC, I believe two years ago. And so immediately Anne and I approached her to say, hey, you know, we've been working on this, would you be interested? And she, she said yes, being new to the campus and just, you know, also looking for some, uh, you know, just to make some connections on campus, I think. And she's been wonderful. But we've also gained um, Robert Wamsner for the marriage and family textbook because not only did we want to get it to our students, but we wanted to get it out to other faculty so that we could get it to as many students as possible. So there are a few more professors using the book. But the book, both the books, but we've also gained, like I say, Robert Wagner on the marriage and family um, for, for as a contributor, contributing editor. I would say the initial startup of the book, uh, I say a summer session, but of course we weren't working eight hours a day Monday through Friday on it. Um, I would say it would take about three hours per chapter, and then after we we completed. We split the chapters in half. I had, you know, seven chapters. Anne had seven chapters. And it would take about three hours per chapter. Then we would switch, and she would take my seven just for editing and to, you know, any additions. And I would do the same for hers. And that would only take about an hour and a half after that. So, <laughs> so it's a lot of work any way you cut it. Yeah, but again, it's sociology. We love sociology, and, we, and we're actually tailoring. It was almost like tailoring. Um, Lectures, like something we would have done anyway, where we're updating lectures and trying to make them the most interesting. It was, it was, it felt a lot like that. This wasn't a research project by any means, and this wasn't, um, you know, a lot of the resources had already been listed for us, so we just got to go above and beyond that resource list. Right, and I think that that's a really important point for for those of you out there who are are thinking or who are not heavily involved and are thinking about about promoting. Uh, the adoption of uh, uh, of uh, open textbooks on your campus. Uh, these folks here, as amazing as it is that that Katie and her colleagues have, have have put in so much work, they did start with some content already that was produced by folks at Utah Valley University, John Ron Hammond and Paul Cheney, and that's 
you know really important in the OER world that, that, that people are working together. You, you produce content, it's not perfect, you pass it on to another group, they improve it, it's still not perfect, they pass it on to another group, and it's, it's been described as a relay race, right? Somebody, you, you, you run with the stuff for a while, then you hand it off to somebody else, and they make it even better. Right, that's exactly what we've been doing. And, and you know, as more and more faculty are adopting this textbook at COC, um, we ask them, anything you see, anything you want to add, please let us know. And we've had, I can't even tell you how many, just, um, minor contributions. Just you know, I, I, if you could just add this in there, or just one more key term, or if you could bold this or move this around, and it really has improved the tech. I mean, it's it's so much different than it was even three years ago. And it was really, I I really proud of how it was three years ago. Um, but we built on it just in huge in huge amounts, and it's it's one of I love I I still love teaching social 101, but that's this is one of my favorite things to present to them on the first day and. I'm teaching two intro to social classes right now, and we continue to see the pattern of of heightened participation with students in class because they've read the material, and uh, and these heightened test scores. And again, the material isn't much different; it's just the way it's presented is different. Well, and the fact that students actually have the material. If a if a, if a textbook is costing 125 or 200 dollars, oftentimes students really won't have access to that material. Right. I've had some students just come to me before we adopted this textbook. Um, I would always have one on reserve in the library, but sometimes they can't come to campus to do the readings if it's on reserve in the library. Sometimes I've had students say they just can't afford it, and will they need it to pass the class? And of course, the answer is yes. And they attempt to share with other students, and that typically is not a very successful modality for learning. Um, and I've had I have I've loaned out some of my books to students who I have gotten back, but. Um, one hundred twenty-five dollars really is not a reasonable price for a lot of our students. Great. One, one other question, Katie. If you still have a couple minutes, uh, another question from the chat was: How difficult was the book to lay out, and did you work with any particular software? You know, the book was not difficult to lay out at all because each chapter was essentially done in Microsoft Word, and then we would change it to a PDF format, so we would upload it right onto. We use Blackboard it. You know, at COC, so we would just upload it right onto a Blackboard shelf for our students. But each chapter individually is just really, you know, about a 15-page Microsoft Word essay. It looks like, or you know, we add our images and our graphs and things like that. But it was very easy. Now, another question then is, do you have any plans to add multimedia to your uh, multimedia pieces to your books? We actually have a few multimedia pieces to our books, um, other than. Something like, um, other than you know, the video clips, the suggested discussion boards, the things like that, because we do discussion boards and things like that. But we actually have um, survey monkeys attached to some of some of our chapters, depending on you know where it's appropriate. And we have online. Um, we actually use these surveys in the Intimate Relationships, Marriage, and Family book, where the class, the the answers are completely anonymous. Nobody knows who's answering what, but the class will go on and answer these survey questions, and they can actually read and see what's going on with people. Usually, we'll use that for what are your, you know, beliefs about something like um, divorce rates, or what are your beliefs about interracial marriage, or something. Even depending on the topic we're talking about, but just to get a consensus of a feeling for normative values and ideas attached to some of these changing familial. Um, Patterns we're seeing in the United States. So we have we have a lot of we have multimedia that way. Great. So, uh, great, great. Great. Yeah. And 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 I'm look, just looking at the chat again. I think there's a question that John will answer in the chat. Is the OER repository uh, the same as the online content management system? John, if you could uh, address that. And yeah, College of the Canyons, we're fortunate to uh, have uh, have licensed uh, have licensed. Um, uh, the Aquella content management system that we use for our OER repository that integrates uh, with Blackboard. So, uh, content that's posted uh, within our Aquella uh, repository can be uh, accessed by anyone uh, and can be pulled into Blackboard uh, easily by our by our faculty. But uh, if we have the, if we post the content only in Blackboard, that which is password protected, then we we would not be able to share that content as easily with with the general public. So, um, Katie, real quick, would you, you you mentioned the marriage and family book and the gender studies book that you're working on? Can you tell us a little bit about 
about those projects and uh, when you expect those to be done and what some of the challenges are? Oh, the marriage and family is already done. We've been using that for about five semesters now. It came just after the 101 book. Um, so that that one has been launched and it is it, we, the same. We found, found this similar results in that test scores are heightened and student participation is heightened. And that was the, that's a really interesting book in that we have all these extracurricular sort of these extra activities in the back to, to just sort of get the you know discussions going. Um, the gender studies book I am working on right now. I have a couple of people that have that are signed up to essentially where each just we agreed to each write a chapter. And this really isn't taking so long because you know maybe a ten page paper on something that we were very familiar with, and a lot of us are using resources that we used, you know, um, in grad school and, and things that we already have, uh, we already have access to. But I'm guessing the Gender Studies book will be launched in fall 2013. Great, thank you so much. And there was a question. I think Kelvin had a question earlier about a list of of open textbooks. If there was a list somewhere. So certainly I'll direct people to College Open Textbooks in the Open Doors group. Yeah. I'll direct people to sailor.org, uh, which is not, does not have a list of, of open textbooks, but has curated content around uh, college courses. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, so that's terrific. Katie, anything else you want to add? Pros, cons, encourage people to do it, discourage people from getting involved? <laughs> You know, I have to say there really are. I have. I have yet to, in the three years that we've been using this, I haven't found any cons. I have yet to have had a student come to me and say they'd rather page 125 for the 45-page chapter, each chapter intro book. Um, and I have actually had seen one really positive thing that's been sort of happening is I have a lot of students who have emailed me and said that they've moved on to four-year university since we've had class together at COC, and they took their intro book with them. And they're using it at their new at their new institution. They didn't feel like they had to sell it back to sort of get you know whatever students they could from selling back a used textbook. So they've taken it with them and they're still using it. Wow, very cool. And hopefully they'll they'll be uh, encouraging their professors at the transfer institution to adopt open textbooks as well. That's terrific, Katie. Thank you so much. Please feel free to stay on with us, but uh, I, I know you you might you might have to go. So we're going to move move on. Uh, but before you go. Uh, I want to point out uh, Jackie Hood uh, shared with us in the chat that a Canvas MOOC is starting in April on gender in comics. That sounds really great. That sounds very good. All right. Well, thank you so much again, Katie. We really appreciate it. And uh, Katie uh, or John, could you type uh, Katie's Katie's uh, email into the chat uh, uh, so that people can contact her directly if they have questions about that that text? And uh, we'll say thank you so much. Um, okay, thank you. Okay, thanks, Katie. So, so moving on, and uh, you know, I think I think you you can hear and, and uh, how how pleased, how fortunate we are at College of the Canyons to have uh, faculty colleagues to to work with who are enthusiastic about uh, doing what's best for their students. You know, I would think all all faculty are motivated to do what's best for their students, but we're exceptionally fortunate uh, that. Uh, uh, our faculty are so uh, so engaged in in open education. Now, of course, I don't want to say that every single colleague here is is able to devote the time and energy that that uh, Regina and, and Katie and, and and their colleagues have done. But uh, we're fortunate uh, that we have uh, we hope created a culture here at College of the Canyons uh, in which uh, sharing is promoted. Uh, it's it's commonplace. We, you know, I think in most in most higher education institutions, it's commonplace that you share your lecture notes with your office mate or your department mate, and we believe that we've created a culture in which it's commonplace to share uh, uh, larger pieces of content with your colleagues and um, through our OER repository and through a lot of the training that John Makovich does, uh, we're able to. Uh, to 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 provide a pathway for instructors to share content in a, in a, on a larger scale. Um, what do we do now, though? We've got we've got some great great uh, examples uh, here on campus. But what else do we do? Well, we really have to put our shoulders into uh, increasing development and adoption. There's, as I mentioned before, and as many of you know, there is an awful lot of great content out there. It's no longer the case that that we all have to start from scratch. Um, we we need to work more strategically uh, to uh, 
encourage faculty to adopt open content in a coherent way so that we could create a pathway for students uh, to a low cost or no cost degree program. There was a question earlier as to whether we had that in mind. We know that Northern Virginia Community College is, is developing a uh, no cost uh, uh, degree pathway and I think some other institutions around the U.S. are doing that as well. So that's something that we certainly want to, uh, to emulate. Um, we will continue to compile lists uh, of, of qual high quality materials and, and make those available to our faculty and to everybody, but particularly to our faculty uh, around subject matters uh, to continue to make it easy or easier for uh, faculty to get involved to create a, a low threshold on ramp, let's say, to uh, utilizing OER and, and of course our colleagues at sailor.org, our colleagues at the Open Doors Group and College Open Textbooks have, have done a lot of great work in those areas. Um, we want to continue to support development of supplemental materials. So uh, if there is a, uh, an open textbook or an open course that's available out there, uh, how do we uh, make sure that, that we're supporting faculty in developing the supplemental materials, the uh, assessments, the uh, review materials, the uh, materials that give students a feeling of, of local authenticity and local connection. Uh, we want. We know that uh, in, in in the online teaching and learning world, there's an increasing uh, body of research that tells us that the, that a human presence and local authenticity uh, helps students uh, feel more engaged and uh, help students uh, uh, persist through through their classes. So, uh, how can we uh, encourage uh, faculty to um, uh, adopt open content? That's let's say. Oftentimes, pretty vanilla and pretty, pretty, uh, pretty generic, uh, but still uh, insert a feeling of connectivity, a feeling of authenticity. That this is this is College of the Canyons. This is my professor. This is somebody I know, and, and I feel connected to that place. So we want to continue to to, to help our faculty uh, in, insert that kind of material. <clears throat> and as always, uh, everyone in in the open open world, we are seeking collaboration. We'd love to. Uh, uh, share with you and work with you in adopting adopting the materials that we talked about today, and we'd love to know more about what you're doing. And uh, uh, that is really, I hope, the greatest outcome of Open Education Week. All the great work that the Open Courseware Consortium is doing and the uh, Community College Consortium for OER is doing to connect people, to connect institutions, connect projects, so that we can continue to lower costs. Uh, increase access and support faculty creativity. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn it back to the chat window and see if we have any any uh, questions out there that I haven't covered uh, or any more questions. Uh, let's see. I'm going to look back through the chat window. Uh, questions about lists of books. I think we we addressed those. Uh, we've got the link to. Uh, oh, Lisa, uh, Jackie posted a link to a video endorsement of the sociology book. Appreciate that. Uh, does anybody out there want to share some share uh, what they're doing? Jackie shared uh, the link to College Open Textbooks. Thank you, Jackie. And thank you, Una. Una has done so much work. Una, Una, and the rest of the Open Courseware Consortium staff have just been phenomenal in organizing Open Education Week uh, this year. Has been so smoothly organized. Uh, it's just. Uh, uh, been terrific. Oh, and Kathy, thank you so much. I'm so sorry. You're, you're, I knew, knew you're on here, and I did not mention our good, good colleagues and friends at Merlot. Uh, Merlot is a terrific, uh, long-standing uh, resource for uh, locating uh, and sharing and uh, um, reviewing uh, open materials. So please check out Merlot as well. Good, good people doing good, good work. Uh, so thank you for that, Kathy. I appreciate that. So there's my contact information. Also, uh, we posted, John posted earlier the contact information for uh, Regina Blasberg and Katie Coleman or Catherine Coleman here at College of the Canyons if you want to get more information about their specific projects. So thank you so much and thanks uh, again to the folks at Open Courseware Consortium, Community College Consortium for Open Educational Resources, and everyone for participating in Open Education Week. Thanks so much. <laughs>